Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Metal Magdalene with Jet right here on Metal Messiah Radio. Tonight, we have a special guest with us. We have Kelly Schaefer of the metal band Atheist. Welcome back to the show, Kelly. Thanks for having me again. Good so, to be talking to you again. So, Kelly, growing up, who were some of your musical influences? Uh, I mean, I, I, I really, I had a pretty um, fast... I, I got a, a pretty good education from my mom's friends. She hung out with a lot of biker people, so they turned me on to a lot of, like, Peter Frampton and Foghat and all that kind of shit when I was, like, really, really young. And then I um, I kind of discovered Aerosmith myself. That was my first concert I went to, so, you know, it made an impression on me. And so I had I had a really good foundation of Roots and, and uh, Bluesy Rock and Zeppelin, of course, and, and Sabbath. And that's when everything kind of changed for me was those two bands really um, opened my eyes up to, to you know, just a, a kind of music that wasn't pop music. And uh, because, I mean, when you're a kid, you're kind of forced to listen to whatever the adults are listening to. So fortunately, I was hanging out with some cool adults. And, uh, and my mom was, I should say. And, and so there was a lot of good music happening a lot. And then, you know, once 14, 13, 14 came, there was, you know, this whole new wave of of uh metal i mean we were into maiden and priest and stuff like that but uh and then along came metallica it just changed everything i think you know uh just sound you know absolutely so. and you know you guys atheist has a lot of stuff coming up but, be but before we get into all that let's tell people a little history behind the band so when did you first start the band and, and why did you want to start this band up kelly well, I mean, we were teenagers. We were all friends. We all had a, the same passion for a particular kind of, you know, a, 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 at that time in the late 80s, this was 1986. So, you know, um, glam rock was king, you know, like Molly Crew and Rat and all that kind of shit. And we definitely weren't down with any of that. I mean, we, we, we sort of had a little appreciation for Molly Crew. I mean, at, of all those bands that at least had a little bit of credibility, they were badasses. And, and so we respected that, but it musically wasn't challenging at all. And, and so we wanted, you know, we really enjoyed the, the faster, heavier stuff. And um, so just we, you know, met in junior high the first time and didn't meet again until we were in high school. Uh, me and my drummer, Steve, the original drummer. And uh, just, um, you know, got together, wanted to play Metallica covers, you know, just because nobody else knew about Metallica and, and, and Anthrax and stuff like that. That, that was sort of underground still at that point. And uh and so we put a band together in uh, 1987, and um, 1988 we signed a record deal, and uh, off we went. We we basically, you know, what led up to that was a compilation record called um, uh, Raging Death, and um, so this was in 1987. It was put out by a label called Godly Records, and basically it was two songs from, I want to say, six different bands, and uh, I think three of those bands went on to get signed, Us, Obituary, and Sadus. And uh, so it, it was distribution for our demo tape, which back then, tape trading, this was before the internet. So uh, the only way for our music to be heard was to send cassette tapes around the world, literally, and uh, hope that they made it and hope that somebody dug in and wrote about it in their, in their little fanzine, um, <clears throat> what we called fanzines, which were photocopy magazines with reviews of bands that wouldn't normally get reviewed. It was really fucking hard <laughs> back then compared to how it is now. You know, I mean, um, you know, where you can just reach so many people with your music right out, like within an hour. But uh, back then it was really difficult. And so, um, you know, we just had this shared passion for weird shit like Merciful Fate and Metallica and, and uh, Slayer and Thrax and, and stuff like that. So we put a band together and uh, we're lucky enough to get, you know, a, a collection of songs that, that, got these people in new york interested and so we've had a, a record deal ever since and you know when you guys first came out too you had like this kind of you know proggy tech metal edge to that there really wasn't a lot of bands out there playing this kind of music so what was you know people's reactions when they were hearing you guys for the first time back then when everything was you know death metal was just starting to come out and it was tough i mean we toured with cannibal corpse and um you know that was a particular crowd that was really into you know while while to the average listener we were very very heavy there were other bands that were way faster and, and more sort of you know with deeper vocals and uh really kind of sludgy and and, and uh blast beats and stuff like that you know it was really super fast and we weren't while we loved speed we we were really big fans of rush and and progressive music and mm -hmm. um Frank Zappa and and uh, just jazz and in general and and that kind of fusion technicality and we just kind of brought that to to metal and uh, just started making these over the top 
kind of arrangements them. And um, just as a, a tip of the hat to, to what we really loved about Rush, you know, they were very complex and the lyrics were very thoughtful and, and introspective and and, uh, and worldly. And I learned a lot. You know, I learned probably more history from Iron Maiden and Rush and, and uh, you know, bands like that from my favorite bands, you know, Zeppelin. I mean, I learned so much about uh, American history and stuff like mm -hmm. that from from rock and roll you know it's really cool i don't think i think that kind of goes unsaid and unnoticed by by uh you know people that criticize you know heavy metal music we actually learn a lot my vocabulary definitely got better <laughs> but uh i don't know what was the question what were we saying? <laughs> well i was just Random. saying though you guys had that like you were saying you had that huge yeah. influence and what what it was like for it, it was what, tough yeah, what were people's, like, tough. reactions, you know what I mean? Because they were, you know, death was, like, bursting onto the scene, and everything was death metal and all this stuff. I said, you guys kind of got this little different edge going on. Yeah, I mean, we wrote a lot about reincarnation and space and aliens, and, and so it was a really different lyrical topic. I was just really kind of into a lot of different things. I, I didn't want to write about, I mean, in the very, the first f four songs of our first record, not the first four, but four of the songs on that record are very mature, very, you know, songs we wrote when we were 15, 16 years old. So there's a song in there called, uh, you know that's that's basically about you know that it's that's in that mold of the death metal because we thought you know well we gotta we gotta be in there you know mm -hmm. to, to separate ourselves and we really didn't and we quickly realized that and and uh but it was very tough because i mean because of the complexity when we played live and people weren't familiar with our music it was confusing to them mm -hmm. and so on many on many instances you know uh we had a tough time and um it wasn't until you know and, and that continued on and through our, our whole career i mean we had a, a a click of people that were in the oh you know they were really into they kind of got what we were trying to do we were just trying to be different we weren't even really trying to be different we just wanted to be different mm -hmm. um because we didn't want to sound like other we just felt like a lot of bands sounded very much alike and we just had deeper roots than that and, and it just kind of came out and so um it took it took us breaking up in 93 and getting back together in 05 before people finally went, oh, you know, and then this whole technical metal thing. Well, actually, <clears throat> you know, it started to unfold before that because bands sort of started sort of discovering our records because of the internet. And, um, and so it spawned this whole technical metal sort of revolution now. I mean, there's so much technicality in metal mm -hmm. now. But I mean, back then it was a, as I always say, it's a, it was a lonely, lonely street corner of, uh, you know, there's only a very small handful of bands that were, that were really pushing the, you know, pushing the time signatures and stuff like that. So, but it's fun. You know, we used to try to just outdo the last song that we wrote. You know, the last one was really complex. Let's try to outdo that. You know, and we had a, uh, a writer friend uh, who actually is uh, the owner of uh, blabbermouth.net these days. He, uh, he's the guy who actually signed us, Boy Boy Crin, and he, you know, we just really would try to literally impress him. You know, we would write a song and cassette, you know, we'd make a little uh, cassette tape of it, send it up to him in New York, and he would say it sucked or it was great or whatever, you know, and we just were always trying to wow him. And uh, as a result, we ended up writing some really great songs. So what were the early days like for you guys? I mean, I know you were saying that, you know, Back then, we had to do tape trading and letter writing and, and all those flyer distribution and all those kind of campaigns. But what were like some of the early shows for you, like Kelly, going out there? We had some stinkers, man. I mean, you know, we had some, <laughs> some, uh, some, you know, but then we had some great ones. I mean, we, we played with Testament and we played with uh, Death Angel back in the day before we got signed and we we're right at the the point where we were about to get signed and um but i mean before that you know playing uh in our hometown um there was an instance where we played a battle of the bands and the police came and we were put out in the alley because they you know 19, late 80s if, if you're familiar with our music i mean you can only imagine that people were shocked like mm -hmm. what the hell is atheist you know like oh you know like i was just you know, it was just tough for them to swallow. <laughs> so, literally, we played this battle of the bands with a uh, with a southern rock band and a sort of a rhythm and blues sort of Gladys Knight and the Pips kind of band. And they had no idea what what we were about, but we didn't go in under atheist because we knew that they wouldn't let us play. So when we signed up for the battle of the bands, we signed up. I can't remember what the hell we called it, but it was something much tamer than atheist. And so he showed up and played and we got done with the first song and people ran up on stage with the people from the club and were, were giving us the throat cutting you know <laughs> stop stop playing and we wouldn't stop playing so they called the police and uh, they literally uh helped us load 
year out of the place. <laughs> but uh, you know, that kind of shit when you're when you're fifteen or sixteen is fantastic. It's great. And they actually wrote about it in the paper the next day. Oh, that's cool. You know, that's kind of funny you mentioned that too because we forget, you know, when you're so in, involved in metal, but geez, back in those days in Florida, oh. you're right, there was the Leonard Skinner's and the Molly yeah. Hatchet and all that kind of stuff, all that, that southern rock. Yeah, Stranger. There was a band called Stranger that was king, and and uh, you know, and, and uh, everything that comes from the south was all not like this. You know, when, <laughs> no, uh, not at all. Especially the town that we live in, Sarasota, is is you know, it's an affluent sort of uh, place that that a lot of old people come to to die. You know, in the last ten years, a lot of young people have sort of showed up and uh, to visit their grandparents and never left. You know, and so there's some young people here now. There's a, a TV show on uh, MTV called Siesta Key, and uh, <laughs> So, have you seen it? No. <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, you know, it's kind of like uh, The Hills or, or one of those kinds of shows where it's, a, you know, like a soap opera. But, uh -huh. but it's, that, that's my home, that's my town. It takes place to keep... in your town. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's, it's a big, it's, it's like a, you know, a reality sort of, uh, right. you know, MTV teen show or all these. But anyway, that town, that'll give you a, a, an idea of, you know, it's very tropical, very Jimmy Buffett, very, um, bluesy you know a lot of blues around here so um it was it was there was definitely nowhere for us to play so it was very mm -hmm. hard to get our music out so we had to send it to new york send it to la send it to san francisco anybody but back then you know without the internet the only way to you know it's definitely hip parader those places were never gonna you know the big magazines were never gonna review our demo so that some label person would hear it but literally what i did is i got um I had a friend uh, who who was a promoter here in town. He's a great promoter in Florida. His name's Tony Refugiato, and he had a record store. And he would get all the new music in, and we would hang out at his record store. And when new shit came in, we would listen to it. And so, when the possess, possess there's a band called Possessed, and the, they had an album that came out on Combat Records. And I I saw the phone number on one of his because he had a record store, so he had like I don't know for some reason there was a phone number there. So I found this phone number and I called and. Uh, um, got, or actually, I got the address and sent our crappy demo, the worst demo ever, to it's, it's just so so bad. And it was recorded back in the day through a, a board mixer. It was just really bad and it sounded terrible. So I sent it. I sent it to him, and then I called him, and he proceeded to tell me that it, it was. A, I was absolutely correct. That it was terrible. And uh, <laughs> but there were some interesting things on there, and he sent it to his friend Borivoy Krin. And Borivoy had a magazine called Violent Noise, and it was all you know, uh, typed on a typewriter mm -hmm. and, and, and taped photographs and photocopied and stapled together and sent around the world. And then had reviews of bands that were underground that nobody else knew about really fucking cool. And, and you know, looking back on it, uh, when, when we were in it, it didn't, you know, it just felt like that was how it was. But now in the internet age, looking back on that, that was, you know, those were some really cool times where you just discover music and like, Oh my God, it was this band, you know, and, and, uh, that nobody else knows about in your hometown, you know what I mean? Because you got it from this, this magazine and, and they're from Brazil, you know, Sepultura, discovering, um, Sepultura, Bori Bori was one of the guys who, who really discovered them and the way down brazil they were doing you know they had a demo and um and he knew about them before anybody did and turned them on to money connor and then went on to sign them uh to roadrunner and, and so that that's the way just everything sort of happened and that compilation record that we that we did um back then was uh executioner who went on to become obituary mm -hmm. and uh so those two songs they distributed two thousand copies of that record and it's, it's a collector's item now it's been 20 uh, 30 years almost and uh because of that we got great distribution for a demo and that's how we got a record deal and um as a result of that um you know people getting it and reviewing it and so uh it was tough and you know these days record deals aren't even oh. you know aren't even a, a reality i mean well i mean we just got i mean they are we just signed a new record deal but i mean they're just they're not the way they used to be not no to, not at all not at all. And there's so many different record labels out there now. You know, back then there was only a few and they were all big. You know, now there's so many things out there. You yeah, know? Indie, indie was, you know, the indie was, um, you know, an indie label was like rarity back yeah. then. And, uh, but now, but see, you know, you really don't need, you know, you really don't need a label these days. No. I mean, you've got great music and, and uh, some social networking skills. You can make a, you know, you can make a wave on your own and, 
you know, pound for pound, that's the best way to do it. Otherwise, you're going to lose control of your music and you're never going to make any money. That's, and, uh, that's true. It's a really ugly, ugly business. It's a shame, you know, because, you know, the artists are always taking advantage of it. I mean, I, I can't tell you all the money I have. You know, I, I'm a song in a movie that never got paid for. You know, just you just know. And, and there's no music police. Right. You know what I mean? There's no uh, IRS for musicians. You know what I mean? The, to, to go after all these people that just, you know, just music is just so trampled on these days. It's a shame, you know. And uh, But it is what it is. I guess it's just you have to find different ways to make money with music now. But certainly making a record and selling that record is not a profitable venture any longer. It's no. just a marketing tool, so to speak. Right. But fortunately, you know, the offsetting of that is that nobody ever talks about it, is to record a record these days is far cheaper. Yeah. Than it ever was before mm -hmm. because of uh, digital technology. So right. You can literally record in your bedroom and have it be the same quality as the records that we used to make back then. So <laughs> actually better these days. So. That's true. Um, That's nuts. true. And now you guys, um, you recorded um, Jupiter in 2010, um, mm -hmm. you know, Elements in what, 1993, and then you had your little disbanding. And then, so what was going on between 1993 and 2010? I mean, did you have thoughts in your head that you were going to get, this was all going to come back together? No, I mean, in 93, we were very frustrated with a number of things. One being the fact that people were still confused by our music. I mean, um, and we were having a hard time. There's no one for us to tour with. There was no one that was like us. So, mm -hmm. to, you know, to to be able to stay on the road and sell a record and do and and plus we had internally some some some, you know, obviously some issues. I mean, we lost our bass player in, in 1991. It was our best friend and you know, it was a really important part of of everything we did and it caused our drummer to sort of say well i'm gonna go to college you know i'm, I'm gonna take the shots and, and go to fsu and uh so i'm out of the band and i was like fuck and mm -hmm. and so that's when elements came about and we were i was literally the band was over after you know after we lost roger we went out and did a little bit of touring and then that's when steve decided he was going to go and so i had started neurotica at that point i that was the very first incarnation of neurotica and i was up in gainesville hanging out with river phoenix and joaquin phoenix and <laughs> um in a studio up there with trying to write this whole different kind of music you know so I really wasn't even thinking about atheist, and then all of a sudden the, the label said, "Hey, listen, you, you have to have a record." And um, at that point, it was about sixty-five days, so I was still, I still had another week and a half to be in the studio up there. I was recording a record, a neurotica record, and and uh, I got somebody to you know put up the money for it and everything. And I was really excited about it, so I wasn't even in that headspace. So the great thing about Elements is that we, I, I literally from up there, I, I, this guitar player that I had seen, Frank Emmy, he was playing in a band called Gentleman Death, and I saw him play one night. For maybe 15 minutes and he was just a monster it was like i you know when you when you know music and you know good musicians you can just see them and go oh that guy's a monster so i remembered him and i found his number called him and said hey man i've got to put a record together uh in a band because at that point rand our original guitar player wasn't in the band any longer we weren't getting along steve wasn't going to be in the band so i, I really had no one i was going to put together this whole new lineup and uh so i did i put together a, a, you know a lineup really quick and it was the bass player and the and the um and the drummer didn't weren't meeting up to the you know to the level of of what we needed to be so i quickly got tony troy and anyway long story short 40 days 40 days to write and record that record and it still stands the test of time today so we had no time to second guess anything and uh <laughs> There was a song on the record that was less than 24 hours old, you know, wow. uh, when we recorded it, and it's still in our set today. So, <laughs> so I always tell people that, you know, like, you know, spending too much time on music is, you know, the, the great thing about music, and I think a lot of artists will tell you that it's, it's um, you know, there's spontaneous combustion that happens musically, and those are the great moments, you know, that just happen, poof, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes when you work too hard on something, it ends up being crappy, you know, right. kind of polishing a turd, so to speak, and, right. and it's... Uh, you know, so so that that's what happened with that record. Now, it's really different than the other two or the other three at this point. It's it's the sort of redheaded stepchild of, of of all of our records because it's got a lot of Latin jazz on it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, sort of those kinds of beats and with a lot of thick death metal guitars and screamy vocals and everything. So, but uh, the whole album is is a, it's a concept record um, about you know it's air, earth, fire, mineral, water. Um, so it was a tough lyrical challenge because I had never written um i had to write the lyrics with preconceived song titles which i've never had to do before oh. on top of the fact that we had 
minimal time to do everything. Uh, but that was the exciting thing. We went to Gainesville and we all rented a house and we lived in that house together. And that's all we did for 40 days and 40 nights is that record. And uh, I always say to people, not to get off on a tangent, but if a band like Metallica really wanted to make a great record, the best thing they could do is go rent a, a nice house, leave their families, and, and go in and, and, and for, for six months live in that house together bitch fight it you know fight and everything you know what i mean and that's how you create great mm -hmm. music you know that kind of tension that's that's why people's earlier records are so much better than their later ones right because you know if you're a lazy millionaire if you're james hetfield and you're laying around <laughs> you know fucking spending your money and you know laying on your, in your house in malibu or where the fuck you are and bring the phone rings hey it's time to go make a record fuck <laughs> you know, you haven't seen those guys in two and a half, three years. Like, oh man, you know, you know, I mean, it's not the same as when you're broke and living in a van, and and uh, and you got your guitar and your girlfriend and your amp and your dog. You know, and that's all you have, and and uh, you just want to make a record so bad, you just want to go on tour. You know, I mean, those 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 are the things that make great records. So, uh, you know, anyway. <laughs> well, that's kind of funny the way you mentioned that because that's what Rush used to do all the time. They used to go up into that house that they had there, do all that, and not come out till they were done. You know. Yes. And listen to those records. You know, I know, and Rush. the Stones, the same thing. You know, all those bands from back then, they all did that. You know, and like you said, to this day, all that stuff is classics now. Blood, blood sugar, sex, magic, red hot chili peppers. They rented a house in California, recorded the whole thing in the house. Uh, you know, with Rick Rubin, and that's a classic record. That's one of the best, if yep. not the best. And uh, you know, you can go down the, the list of of how that's been and. So there's got to be some science in that, you know. So I uh, mm -hmm. I like the idea of doing that. Now we, you know, we're not afforded that uh, that opportunity right, on, on right, this upcoming right. record. So we're gonna we're gonna be doing it. But you know, we weren't on the last record either. And but I mean, back in the day, you know, we would we would practice five, sometimes six nights a week, you know, yeah. because we just when you're 15, 16, 17, 18, sure. you know, you really, you know, it, it was fun. We at our rehearsal spot, it was like a club. You know, we weren't old enough to drink yet. So, but at our in our place, we could drink, smoke, fucking play metal, and <laughs> right. everybody would show up. And it was in a really sort of um, in a place where you know nobody, we, you know, was an industrial park, so there was never any noise complaints or anything. So it was ideal. And we literally would write songs in front of a hundred people. <laughs> um, if you can imagine a hundred people sitting around watching us you know like write these crazy literally the songs on piece of time and uncrustable presence were written in front of lots of people um and us fighting and sometimes coming to blows and uh you know that that tension creates good shit the good old days <laughs> and on you and you know mentioning a piece of time you guys did that uh tour in europe and the usa to celebrate the 20th anniversary of that release so what was that how was that all like Oh man, well coming back, you know, I mean it's everything changed. I mean we, we left after, you know, a tour of, you know, just, you know, a spatter of people and we went and the next show, I think the first show back we did was Wacken in Germany uh, for 60,000 people. You know? I'm not sure if all 60,000 were there at that point when we played, but I mean we had a a wealth of them and it was it was just a great experience and we did um uh we went to prague i think uh, on that trip and um where else we go uh you know just eastern europe and western europe uh, we were just blown away because we thought that uh you know 17 years had gone by and we were just i mean I, when we came back in 05 that we, once we reissued all the records because that's what happened our, the, our records kind of went out of print we signed a really bad record deal back in the day and so that's why i had sort of thought that atheist was done and, and that nobody was ever going to remember it and so people brought a brought us back as a result of of finding of finding those records the, the ones that we did sell back in the day um and, and sort of uh turning their kids onto it and you know their kids grew up and now they're 16 and they're like holy shit technical metal is you know what i mean and they get formed ends and you know what i mean and that's how it really how it happened so when we got there we thought there was just gonna be a bunch of old dudes at our meet and greet and uh you know dudes our age and <laughs> and uh it was gonna be really embarrassing you know we were worried about you know playing with all these young bands and so uh that was completely the opposite uh, we had a huge blind at our mean green all all of them were kids and some of them were, were younger than our songs and so we were like holy shit that's so amazing and so that's 
the, the great story of, of, uh, of us coming back was just this whole new generation of kids. And man, it was unbelievable. And then it's been that way ever since. And we've, we did a number of uh, European tours and we got probably uh, 23 countries in and we still got some, when we get ready to, to fire up the engines again at the end of the year, we'll go to Brazil and uh, Australia and New Zealand, um, places that we haven't been, but I mean, in places like Holland and Germany and, and I mean, we were just blown away by the, uh, the response. And, uh, so now we've, you know, we've got a nice little cozy spot in history and it's cool. You know, I mean, uh, it's what you dream about when you're a kid, you know, that you can, there's a lot of fucking people making music, you know, mm -hmm. it's really difficult, really, really difficult to, to, to leave your thumbprint on, on, uh, on a period of time, you know, and, uh, Something that I'm super, you know, I could give a shit whether I make, ever made millions of dollars making music, which is how people judge you as a musician, mm -hmm. you know, outside of music. You know, they say, oh, well, you know, if you're in a magazine, do you make any money? Uh, no, no, you live in an apartment. Oh, well, you know, like you're a failure. You know, it's like, <laughs> hey, man, listen, if I could put a price on my experience, you know, in the things that I've done, like I'd be a wealthy, wealthy man. You know, you can work your nine to five your whole life. You can make a hundred grand a year and just spend it and go to fucking Disney World once a year and good for you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I promise you, you can't put a price on the shit that I've done and seen. No, you know, no, no. There's no. a different kind of wealth in life. You know what I mean? It's not all about money. And uh, so, um, but, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's just a great thing that the music has survived this long. That kind of music, that extreme music has survived and evolved. And now it's here to stay. And I love that. I love that extreme metal is, you know, it didn't, it wasn't a passing fad. It wasn't any of those things. It's now got this rooted history and, you know, bands like Cannibal Corpse and Monstrosity. These guys have made over 10 records. You know, I mean, they've, uh, you know, there's this catalog of shit. And, and I love that. And I love that my kids... When I'm gone, we'll we'll be able to Google that shit and be like, "Wow, Dad was crazy." <laughs> um, my dad was making some dope music, you know. I mean, and I, I like that, you know. I like the uh, the idea of that. So that's kind of why I do what I do now is just to leave a, more of a more of an impression, you know, from when I'm not here. So. And you know, and it was like you were saying too when we were talking about the internet. Now, that's one of the nice things about the internet too is that. These kids are rediscovering this music, you know. You see them, like, on YouTube, and they're like, what is this? I never heard this. And they're learning all this music work. Without the internet, how would they even know it was out there, you know? So it has its good points, you know? <laughs> no question. I mean, uh, there, there's, you know, the good and the bad of this. You know, you have to sort of move and shift and change with, with evolution of, of uh, technology and of, of everything. And it's just frustrating when you're on the on the ass end of it, you know, as a musician. And you're like, oh, man, you know, you know who, who really benefited from all these different format changes are bands like ACDC who, who started off on, you know, fucking vinyl and eight track and cassette and CD and, and then... And then now digital downloads, they've, they've made millions and millions and millions of dollars off because every, each format, you know, the music listener had to go out and buy that. Oh, I got to get it on CD. Mm -hmm. So imagine how many millions and millions of copies of their of back in black have been sold every time the format changes, you know, it's, uh, it's just, man, to make a record like that was amazing. But, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, the internet has, has really changed the game and everything. And it's, it's, you know, people now that you know the good side of it is yes you can easily people can discover your band and hopefully buy your product or go to a show i mean well that's why concert tickets are so expensive these days because you know bands are like shit you know and it doesn't help when bands like you two give the record away it's fucking right, assholes right, are already right. so so rich that you know oh we're giving it away so you know if if chevy started giving away cars i'm sure ford would be like hey what the fuck you know like mm -hmm. what are you doing? You're giving, giving you can't give the cars away, dude. You're you're devaluing everything. <laughs> right, right. So here we are in 2018, a 30 year career now. You guys, you've had with ACS, and you just signed to Agonia Records. So how did that all come about? Well, we um about two years ago we signed a management deal with Extreme Management Group in New York, and uh, we've always been self managed our whole career, and you know probably not a great idea you know we probably could have been afforded a lot more opportunities if we had management along the way but we just never did and you know and that's attributed to like i said you know starting off not even thinking anybody was going to give a shit about the band and come back and we just did all of our own booking and yada yada so we signed with them and they're great they 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 have a lot of uh 
of success in, in getting their bands tours and uh, they have suffocation who are good friends of ours and and um, they manage a lot of great bands so um and you know personally because they're women i really love working with women as opposed to men in this business because women really seem to be the ones who actually drive this business <laughs> in my opinion you know so props to the ladies and uh so so um they they uh they really procured this deal for us and um we were on season of mist and um just you know i don't want to you know they, they for whatever reason it just didn't work out the relationship between us and um, i'll just leave it at that but you know we um had an agreement that agreement didn't end up being uh coming to fruition so they said listen let us get you uh you know let us get you with another label uh and so we can get this new record uh well and so it took about a year to put together they worked really hard and put together a fantastic deal with agonia and um they had some ground floor knowledge of <clears throat> of the label and, and you know in, in the inner workings and so um you know that's invaluable in this business and for us you know to, to be around for this long and to sign a brand new deal it just feels great you know it just feels to still be relevant and be non-relevant and uh and actually you know still still matter enough to sign a brand new deal it's pretty tough to do and so i'm, I'm proud of the band and i'm really looking forward to making this record because it's going to be uh you know we're going to take a really big swing at it and uh and really try to go out and support it on tour and uh you know, kind of really take a, a, you know, play some bigger places and some bigger shows and really kind of get some, we've never really toured that much. Um, mm -hmm. You know, everybody's got a lot of family. Um, you know, it's just difficult when you get older. We Had we had this, the success that we have now back when we were kids, and then we were, you know, we would have been able to tour a lot more, but it's a lot more difficult in businesses and kids and, and all that. <clears throat> you can't just leave for six months at a time unless there's a lot of money involved. Right. Which there's and, <laughs> and, and you <laughs> and you mentioned you know doing some touring and stuff like that and your label mentioned like a tentative date for the you know a new album from you guys sometime near the end of the year so did you guys i mean are you in the writing process then yeah we're just you know we've been individually writing um you know since the middle of last year like i've been you know sort of compiling riffs and um i've got riffs you know, compiled from before that, that, um, you know, that I still want to use. And I'm in the studio like once a week. So I'm always playing and, you know, just music is just, there's ideas there, you know, we just haven't been able to get together. So, uh, that's where we're at right now. We're getting ready to, in the, in the next <clears throat> couple of weeks, uh, to get in a room together and bash it out. And that's, that's when things really come together quickly. And we just sort of combust off of each other and, uh, so no matter how much we work at home, it comes together a hundred times faster. When we're just sitting in a room together. So all the guys live up in Atlanta um, and we're going to go. So I fly up there and hang out for the weekend and we just jam it out for a couple of days and then come back home and uh, head back up a couple of weeks later. So I'll have to do that probably six, eight times and, uh, and get everything together and then we'll uh, get in the studio and record it. That won't take very long. And um, yeah, so we're hoping for like September, you know, maybe October. And uh, yeah, and then we'll be touring on into you know the end of two on into 2020. And now, uh, who's in the band, Kelly? Who's in the band now? Well, I I, uh, I can tell you that Steve Flynn, our original drummer, is in the band. Uh, Chris Martin, who's uh, been with us live, hasn't made a record with us, but is our super secret weapon. He's uh, just a super talented young guitar player from from Atlanta, and I uh, can't say enough about him. I cannot wait to make a record with him. And, it's, uh, and then Jason Holloway has also been on tour with us for uh, all of Jupiter. He, he did all the touring for Jupiter, and he's a great guy, great player. And um, he sort of plays all of my parts um, that I played on the album. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of the... And uh, so he um, he and Chris and myself and Steve, our bass player situation is... Um, is is secure i just can't talk about it yet or okay. I, you know i i want to i want to but at the moment that i can I, I'll, I'll hang up and let you know and it's exciting and it's really really cool i can't wait to, to break the news and uh and but i just want to make sure that it all be right it's all set in stone and all good to go but uh when we do make the announcement, i think everybody's gonna be really excited about it and uh it's gonna be a ferocious band and we're gonna um Probably, you know, Steve, our drummer, is not going to tour uh, as much as we're actually going to tour as a band. So I'm um, kind of putting together, 
you know, I'm going to have a touring drummer. Right, so, um, right. looking, looking for, I'm looking for that monster out there. There's somebody out there that, uh, that feels like they can handle it. It's a very unique position. Anybody that's familiar with our music knows that the drumming is one of the most incredible things about our band. And, uh, he's, uh, there's a lot of guys that, you know, that play faster and heavier and, and, uh, you know, but he just has this really unique style, so it's tough to find somebody that can uh, fill those shoes live. So we've been um, scouring the planet to uh, to find that guy, and uh, so that way we can tour more because he's got you know four kids, and and uh, it's just tough for him to, to for us to to realize the opportunities and, and be able to play you know and support the record properly. We gotta you know, we gotta get out and do some touring. I also have you know um, two kids here at home, so you right. know not going to go out for, you know, and do any kind of Metallica tour. Right, it's, right. You know, those, <laughs> Unless you're getting Metallica them. pay. <laughs> those are family killers right there, you know, I mean, uh, and band killers, you know, and I, we've always been, we, we've always, you know, I, and I, I think this is a great idea that bands should, should take heed to this because, you know, if you, if you do 14 shows, and you come home and you decompress and you see your family and you go back out and do 14 more. You don't have time to get tired of each other. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And especially when you get older. It's different when you're kids, I guess. But, you know, we're grown-ass men now. So to be on a tour bus together for too long, you know, it's just like you miss your family. You miss your thing. You know, so two weeks is really crazy. You bash out, like, you know, 14 shows. The You know, by show four, you're on fire, you know, and you're just killing it to the end. And, uh, and it's fun and um you know and it, and it represents sort of a chapter and you go home and go back again in, you know four to six weeks or so and it's a lot of traveling it's more traveling but it's a, you know it's just better and better quality shows instead of 250 shows a year that's just a fucking grind that 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 breaks bands up and kills families and so that's not the way to tour in 2018 i don't think unless you're massive and you're making tons of and see you know when you go on a, a metallica tour you can take your family with you right you know? right you know, a fleet of buses. That's and, you know, true. it's a whole different experience. Killer hotel. So all you know, daddy's gotta dip out for an hour and forty five minutes a night and that's it. There's yeah, kids right. don't even know what the fuck's <laughs> going on. They're in a five star hotel and uh, you know, sleeping in their in a bed, so they don't really even know what's going on. So that's the way that must be really, really nice to never have to leave your family at home uh, and I could stay on the road forever then. Yeah, you know no kidding. I mean? uh, who who wouldn't? No, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Kelly, I mean, with this new album, I mean, do you have, I mean, I know we probably can't talk about it yet, but I mean, do you have, like, in your mind what you want the subject matter to be on this album as you're writing? No. <laughs> no. I do not. <laughs> I, I have no well, idea. Well, get going, I mean, Kelly. You only got a year. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it just doesn't work like that with me. And it's, again, I, I react. And, um, you very much a, a counter puncher when it comes to uh, the music. The music punches me in the face, and then I punch it back with lyrics. You know, and mm-hmm. so once I once I have the music, and I just respond and react to that. Yeah. And, and then those those um, I'm gonna guess that there's gonna be a lot of you know I'm not you know I'm gonna do my best to stay as 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 far away from politics as I can. I'm going to refer to, you know, I'm going to, without, I just can't help but not refer to what's going on in the right, state of, right. since the last time I've, even since the last time we made a record in 2010, life has changed so fucking much mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, but, you know, everybody knows how much has changed. It's widely known, so I don't need to cover it in a song, but certainly the overall, um, state of affairs of today is pretty disheartening. There's a lot of really, you know, I, you know, dealing with autism, you know, with my daughter and, and the way people react to that and there'll probably be a little bit of you know a sort of uh, uh <clears throat> you know a story about that because that, that's something that really bothers me that's this lack of awareness that people mm-hmm. have for autism and and uh how it's just sort of written off and you know having to see my daughter go through it for 12 years and, and have to go through it myself as well with her uh, you know I, it'll probably get touched on on the record somehow mm-hmm. you know but i always try to just be as vague as possible because i don't like to be, be super um, right you know, like I, I like to, you know, I like it to be sort of art, artful and um, clever if I can be, you know. And as far as music goes, you're not going to stray too far from the path, are you? I mean, we, we can't. I mean, we don't, <laughs> we don't know any other way to, to make music. I mean, uh, that was the great thing about Jupiter is once we got together and started writing, we were like, holy shit. You know, we I had written, you know, all those neurotica records and, and was completely as far away from atheist as possible. And then it just literally was like riding a bike. We just got in a room and all of a sudden wrote that first song. And we were like, it was so third person that it was 
bizarre to us. Where it's like, wow, that's an, there's another atheist. So it just sounds like us when we play together, and that sounds hokey, but it's just truly the way it is with us. And so uh, I, I don't think we have a choice, really. We, you know, it's just going to be weird and crazy. And, you know, if anything, it's going to be more weird and crazy just because uh you know it's been a while since we made a record and there's a lot of the, the world can take it now you right, know what i mean right. like back in the day uh you know we we had to put a governor on it back then just so people could swallow what we had and so these days there's really nothing that we're going to do it's going to you know be any crazier than what's already out there that so it's now now it's really a matter i mean our goal even on jupiter was Okay, so now everybody's crazy and fast and technical and, and nutty and everybody can play their fucking instruments now and, and hooray, hurrah, that's awesome and I'm super proud of everybody. So now let's write some songs. Now can you can you t- take all that technicality, can you take all that virtuoso shit and combine it and, and learn how to write a really good song with it, a memorable, catchy, but clever technical song. And, and I feel like we touched on it on Jupiter, but we're going to fucking knock it out of the park on this new record. It's going to be a super catchy, over-the-top technical, I think, uh, fiasco. You know, I mean, that's that's how I predict it. And now this is going to be a full length, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be, uh, and, you know, we've, because of the kind of band we are, you know, people, some people, was, you know, we've had one record that was 28 minutes. Uh, we never made a record, I don't think, over 33 minutes, but you can't you know, each song has, uh, you know, it's like this roller coaster ride of, of riffs. So, I mean, uh, 33 minutes of an atheist of atheist music is is, is enough. So, <laughs> it's not going to be like something Floyd record. It's going to be super long or anything, but uh, it'll probably be, you know, the long struggle that we've done. Enough. You know, we're going to aim to put an extra song on because we've always gone with eight songs. So, this time around, I think we're going to go with, with uh, nine songs. And, and uh, yeah, so no, this will be good. You know, I'm looking forward to it. I can't, I, you know, I really, I look forward to it just as much as anybody else that's into the band, you know. <laughs> um, getting together with those guys, you know, I'm a huge fan of the guys in my band, you know, and especially my drummer, you know, so I'm always excited to, to write music with him because he just blows my fucking mind with the stuff he comes up with, so I'm excited. <laughs> and now I know you guys have some merch out, so where can people go to learn more about Atheist and maybe pick up some merch and see what's going on with you guys? I can tell you that if you, if you are such an atheist, type in atheist band, because otherwise you'll get a lot of religious jargon <laughs> and a lot of crap. Right. You know, it's one of the un- unfortunate things about the internet. It hasn't uh, differentiated between us, the band, and the religions. So, you know, we get a lot of uh, a lot of confusion when people go to Google search the band and they get all kinds of crazy stuff. So I would say, you know, type in atheist band and uh, all of our, our, you know, usual stuff, uh, Facebook and everything will show up. It's facebook.com slash... Uh, atheist official and um you know we're gonna have a a dot com coming up here soon it's getting put together now and um you know uh agonia agonia Mm -hmm. should have all the information i mean i'm a pretty you know come to my facebook you know i'm pretty easy uh you know you know that i'm I'm pretty easily reached so uh yeah you know it's gonna be now our merchandise uh we just did a new deal with um Shadow Kingdom. Do you know them? Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with them? Yes, I am. And uh, so I'm wearing one of those shirts right now. It's all ready for my for my video interview. Worth the new shirts, but anyway, got like a red piece of time shirt um, <laughs> that, that's new that hasn't been out yet, and uh, a new unquestionable shirt. Um, we also have another deal with a with a Polish. So there's two new merch deals. If you uh, if you go to um, or Facebook, both of those are on there. Um, so all the all the links and stuff. Yep. Official. Yeah, like you said, yeah, just yeah. put Atheist Band and it comes up, and you got links to all kinds of stuff on there, you know, the merch yeah. and all that kind of thing. 30 years of stuff. Yeah, yeah. there's yeah. a lot all of stuff, stuff there. So. Yeah, but uh, all the new stuff is there as well. And uh, you can also um, reach out to Extreme Management Group, you know, to contact uh, mm-hmm. you know, any of the, to get any of the links. And, and, and uh, like I said, you know, Kelly Schaefer on Facebook, I'm there. So and I love talking to people. And, you know, it's one of my favorite things about being in a band is, is the people and getting to, you know, hear, you know, hear their, their, how they discover the band and how they discover music. And, you know, I'm just a music fan like everybody else. So I really enjoy talking to people. There you go. Kelly Schaefer and his band Atheist are back and you can follow them on Facebook and look for them in the Agonia Records. We're on Twitter too. And on Twitter. uh, Yeah. All those things. Atheist band. You got some things on. Atheist band. (laughs) You're everywhere. (laughs) (laughs) Kelly, 
Thank you so much for coming on the show tonight, telling us about the history of the band and, and what, for having me. what we can expect by the end of the year. And when that album drops, Kelly, you got to come back on so we can talk about it more. I would love to. Have a wonderful night. <laughs>